Jade here. I've recently had an existential crisis that made me question my entire life and existence. Since then, I've wanted to understand the nature of true reality and share my discoveries with you guys so we can find out together. So in this video, we're going to be taking a closer look at reality. While I was thinking about the best place to start, it occurred to me, are humans even capable of understanding reality? Do we have the right tools? Do we see external reality as it truly is, or a fictional story our senses tell us? In the 18th century, the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant argued that we can never have access to the unfiltered thing in itself of objective reality. Plato compared our entire life experience to mere shadows on a cave wall. Now a lot of time has passed since Kant and Plato, and a lot of advancements have been made in science. We'll be exploring this question through the lens of modern science, and quick spoiler alert, the conclusion is rather unsettling. It turns out modern science actually agrees with those old-timey philosophers. We don't see reality as it really is, like, at all. We generally think that our senses are an accurate depiction of the external world, like a window or a camera. Many great philosophers throughout history thought that everything we can know, we know through our senses. Taste, hearing, sight, smell, and touch. So you'd think that to be successful in the world, as us humans clearly are, it'd make the most sense to see the world accurately, that our ancestors who saw reality clearly had a competitive advantage over those who didn't. If you think this is the case, let me show you an image. Look at these two squares. What colour are they? One looks brown and one looks orange, right? Well, that's what your eyes are telling you. It's what they're telling me too. Now look at what happens when we black out the rest of the image. The two squares are, in fact, exactly the same colour. Because of the way the light was shone, your brain corrected the image to what makes sense in the real world. In other words, your perceptual reality did not match the objective reality. Here's another example that you've probably seen. Back in 2015, a very similar phenomenon took the internet by storm. This simple image of a dress quickly became a viral sensation, so much so that it became known as the dress that broke the internet. Let's see why. If you haven't seen this before, what colors do you think the dress is? Now ask people around you what color they think it is. It looks white and gold to me, but to some, this dress appears black and blue. The reason this image had such an effect on people was because it revealed differences in human colour perception, something we thought was an objective property about the world. We're used to having conflicting opinions about politics, but about colour? This just goes to show that our senses, like our opinions, are biased and depend on our internal makeup. A good example of this is colour blindness. But it's not just our vision that can deceive us, it's all of our senses. Listen to this audio clip. <laughs> Each time you hear it, try to hear either Brainstorm or Green Needle. Which one do you hear? You hear whichever one you want to hear. Your perception is influenced by your state of mind, by what you're expecting to hear. These are just a few examples of how our experiences depend more on what we're expecting than what's actually there. But not only are our senses easily deceived, they're also incredibly limited. The German word umwelt refers to the different way that each animal sees the world. Dogs, for example, don't see in colours, but in smells. Bats don't see at all, but hear their environment. Every animal has an umwelt, including us. We like to think that what we see is the objective external reality, but it is just, in fact, another umwelt. We can see the entire visible spectrum of light, but that's by no means the only light that's out there. Reindeer can see ultraviolet light and bumblebees can sense radiation in the UV spectrum. Birds have twice the number of colour receptors in their retinas than we do. And mantis shrimp can even see which direction light is vibrating. By now, you're hopefully convinced that, at least some of the time, we don't see reality as it truly is. Now, this brings us to the next question. How? How is it that we don't see what's actually there? Anil Seth, a British professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex, claims that everything that we perceive is a construction of the brain, what he calls controlled hallucinations. 
It's no secret that our brains are capable of making us see and hear things that just aren't there. Ask anyone who's taken recreational drugs. They'll often report to hearing things that don't make sense or seeing things they know couldn't possibly exist. The same is true for mentally ill people, though they don't always know they're hallucinating. But Seth claims that all of us are always hallucinating. We just agree on the hallucination. Instead of perception depending largely on signals coming into the brain from the outside world, it depends as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. We don't just passively perceive the world, we actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the inside out as from the outside in. It might be helpful to clear up here exactly what we mean by hallucinations. Hallucinations don't always need to be crazy, colorful visions or magical flying beings. The word simply means an experience involving the apparent perception of something not there. So how does this happen? Well, what if I told you that just 10% of the information that we use to see comes from our eyes and the other 90% is filled in by our brains? An example of this is blind spots. The retina, right at the back of your eye, contains millions of tiny light detectors called rods and cones. This is how we see. They cover the entire retina, except for a spot where the optic nerve connects to the brain. This is a blind spot, as there are no photoreceptors, so no light can be detected there. Now your brain fills in these blind spots so you don't notice them. If you don't believe me, just look at this. Cover your right eye and look at the green dot. Slowly move your head towards the picture. At one point, the red dot will disappear and your brain will fill in the space with white. It doesn't look like any of the image is missing. Your brain actually fills it in with something that isn't there. This is a slightly different example of a controlled hallucination of your brain presenting you with something that isn't there. Notice that the two desert scenes at the bottom are basically the same, just flipped. Now stare at the dot between the red and green. Don't look anywhere else. As you're staring at that dot, your brain is learning that the left side of its visual field is under green light and the right side is under red light. That's becoming its new reality. Now when I tell you to, not yet, I want you to look at the dot between the desert scenes. We need a bit more time for your brain to get used to its new reality. So to stop things getting awkward, I'll sing a quick song I made up. Red and green in the desert scene. Green and red are in your head. Okay, that's enough of that. Now look at the dot between the two desert scenes. Do they still look the same? The one on the left should look reddish and the one on the right should look greenish. Weird, huh? You're seeing with your brain, not with your eyes. Take a moment to let that sink in. Even though these were just demonstrations, Seth claims that your brain is doing this all the time and not just with sight, but with all your senses. The great Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei once said, I think that taste, odors, colors, and so on reside in consciousness. Hence, if the living creature were removed, all these qualities would be annihilated. So if you're not seeing the raw information that's actually there, what are you seeing? Well, as neuroscientist and world-renowned expert in perception, Bo Lotto says, What you see is a meaning that was useful to see in the past. You see what we call the empirical significance of information. You see the behavioral value of the data, not the data. In the example of the desert scene, it was useful at one point for our brains to perceive that the left side of its visual field was under green light and the right side was under red light. So when we adjusted our gaze, our brain assumed that, hey, if it was useful in the past, it's probably still useful now. Another example of this is the fact that hills appear to look steeper to us if we're wearing a heavy backpack. We are literally seeing the extra effort it's going to take. We see the meaning of the information, not the information itself. This brings us to our next question. Why? We've talked about the fact that our brains often deceived us and we've talked about how, but why would they do this? It's counterintuitive to think that evolution favors those who don't see reality as it is. But that's exactly what cognitive psychologist and best-selling author Donald Hoffman says is the case. The assumption is that evolution has shaped us so that our constructions match the truth. And I'm going to argue against that, that, our, that evolution shaped us with a user interface 
that hides the truth. Nothing that we see is the truth. The very language of space and time and objects is the wrong language to describe reality and that that's very useful. And that's why we're here. But how could this be? How could not experiencing reality as it really is be more useful to us? Intuitively, it seems that being able to experience reality accurately would make you more capable of surviving in it. Well, here Hoffman tells a tale of the Australian jewel beetle. This is a male jewel beetle living in Outback Australia, and he's out looking for a female to mate with. Female jewel beetles are shiny, dimpled, and brown. Now, Aussies living in the Outback love a good beer, and it just so happens that beer bottles are also shiny, dimpled, and brown. Now, some irresponsible people just toss the bottles out when they're done with them. And sadly, the male jewel beetles try to mate with them, thinking they're females. If that's not sad enough, ants have learned to hang around near beer bottles and wait for the confused beetles, then devour them, genitalia first. This blunder of the beetle is surprising. This species has survived for thousands of years. You would think that, surely, they know they're females from a glass bottle. Yet Australia had to change its beer bottle design to stop the beetle from going extinct. So why should a beetle fall for a bottle? Well, the answer is, according to Hoffman, that it was using simple shortcuts and tricks. Apparently, a female jewel beetle is anything that is shiny, dimpled, and brown. But surely, we're different from a beetle, right? They have tiny brains and are nowhere near as complex as us. Surely mammals with their bigger brains wouldn't make such silly mistakes. Well, moose in Alaska, Montana, and elsewhere have been found and photographed mating with metal statues of moose, and even bison, sometimes for hours on end. They're using simple shortcuts and tricks to survive. Observations like these led Hoffman to the hypothesis that evolution favors fitness over accuracy. Fitness refers to a species capability to reproduce and survive, while accuracy refers to a species capability to see the world accurately. It's important to mention here that this is a very strong position and is not the prevailing consensus among neuro and cognitive scientists. A lot of them do in fact believe that our senses are picked an objective external world. At the moment, the fitness over accuracy hypothesis is still exactly that, a hypothesis. Hoffman does go into it further and make more arguments for it in his um, book, A Case Against Reality. If you'd like to read more about it, I've linked to the book below. But this hypothesis does lead to a few puzzling questions, like how could it possibly be advantageous for us to not see the world accurately? And if we're not seeing the world accurately, how are we all seeing the same thing? Well, Hoffman answers all these questions with a simple and elegant analogy. He compares our experience to a desktop interface. Suppose that you're writing an email, and the icon for that email is blue and rectangular and in the middle of the desktop screen. Does that mean that the email itself is blue, rectangular, and in the middle of the screen? Of course not. Anybody who thought that completely misunderstands the point of the desktop interface. It's not there to show you reality. The circuits, the bits, the electric pulses that are really what the email is. If you had to toggle voltages, your friends would never hear from you. It's just too hard. What evolution has done is give us a user interface. It lets you control reality without actually seeing reality. And this is how it's useful not to see reality as it really is. It's also the reason why we're all seeing the same thing. Even though a desktop isn't the reality of what's actually going on inside the computer, we all see the same desktop um, interface when we log into our PCs or Macs. Even though this is a very strong position to take, it can't be denied that at least some of the time, our brain is not showing us true reality. So what should we do? Should we just give up on trying to understand the world around us, except that we're just not capable of knowing? Well, I'm not willing to give up that easily. This is my very first video in my quest to understand reality. It'd be pretty pathetic if I just gave up and was like, oh, well, you can't. Sometimes knowing what you don't know is the first step forward. I honestly don't know where I'm gonna go from here, but I do know that I'm going to keep trying to understand reality and keep making videos about it. So I really hope you join me along the way. In the meantime, some words of encouragement from Bo Lotto are to celebrate doubt, to embrace the unknown instead of being afraid of it. That being aware of our biases and limitations should remind us to constantly question everything, to question all of our assumptions. And I think that's a pretty good place to start. My regular viewers might have noticed that this video was quite different to what I usually do. As I mentioned, I had an existential crisis and this made me want to understand life and existence, which naturally led me to philosophy. 
This video was just the first of a philosophy series that I'm starting on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming video platform built by and for independent creators like CGP Grey, Braincraft, Minute Physics, Knowing Better, and Real Engineering. We're building Nebula because we want a place for educational creators to try out new content ideas that might not work on YouTube, like my philosophy series. Normally, Nebula is $3 a month, but we've partnered with our friends at CuriosityStream to get you free access to Nebula with a CuriosityStream subscription. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service with thousands of high-quality documentaries. If you liked my recent mini-series on quantum biology, I'd highly recommend this documentary, The Secrets of Quantum Physics. It explores other instances of quantum biology and is presented by one of the pioneers of the field himself, Jim Al-Khalili. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so they're offering Up and Atom viewers free access to Nebula when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash up and atom. By signing up to CuriosityStream, you'll be helping not just me, but the entire community of educational creators. Nebula is a place where creators can really make what they're passionate about, not just what will get a lot of views. If you'd like to join me in my quest to understand our wonderful existence, sign up to CuriosityStream using this link, which you can find in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye.